One, two, yep, okay. <laughs> so you're probably wondering why on earth did I do that? Um, so my name is Harry Yef. I focus primarily on voice. I came from performance. Um, I've always been a part of the avant-garde of voice, uh, understanding what is the scope and limit. And the human voice is just a profoundly important and fascinating space. If you remove all musical connotations, there's a huge responsibility for us to think about well, what is the scope, what is the limit, but also there are still innovations happening in voice, uh, which is a very strange thing, especially it being an absolute uh, profound and fundamental part of human existence. So I founded a studio in 2018, which was all about the experimentation of the absolute bleeding edge of voice-centered experiences, but also just using the voice as a conduit to explore and deepen uh, our understanding of the technology. The most important part of art and experience in this context is separate to technical challenges. The zeitgeist perception of a specific technology has huge, huge influence on the retention and the accessibility of said technology. So not all artists are relevant to that challenge. But when we think about, well, what is this new breed of creative technologist that can actually work with engineers and in some way have a deeper understanding of what is success, what is the actual use cases for the technology? And my most recent collaboration is actually uh, curating the Artistic Intelligence Series, which is a collaboration with ITU and United Nations, highlighting specific artists that can help uh, deepen our understanding of technology. So the most important <laughs> problem that we have are narratives of fear. The sentiment is, is that if you can make knowledge explosive and experiential, this does have some practical <laughs> contribution. Art is nice, beauty is great, but the idea is like, can you transfer the narrative? Can you change the, the approach, the mental attachment that people have to a specific technology so that they're more open? and changing narratives of fear to narratives of hope. And this is very much my intention uh, in my work, but I focus primarily on the voice. So more recently, uh, I've been very fascinated by lateral explorations of preservation. In one context, we may think of storage. For other people, we're thinking about legacy. Um, and the artist ego <laughs> in me, many of my projects started with my own voice. So one example is several years ago in 2018, I was invited into an ex-nuclear reactor, which has no relevance uh, to the project, um, to meet Imogen Heap and Martina from the Sister Moon project. And uh, it was there that I actually sent my voice uh, via radio signal um, to the moon. And it was bounced off the moon and bounced back to Earth. But what I found most fascinating is many of the radio frequencies are still traveling at the speed of light out into space. And it made me think about, well, actually, the, the media that we create, the content that we make, it's a very difficult challenge, the concept of preservation. But most important, there is this concept of time. And I think that the narratives that we have, the way that we think about preservation, is actually uh, needs a lot of work for the general zeitgeist. So what are some other interesting examples of, of how we can approach that? The second uh, contextualization is like, why are voices important? So why am I spending my life focusing specifically on that, forgetting about the music? Is that language, on average, has about 30 phonemes. There are languages that have more. But if you compare those pieces of language to the actual expression of voice, um, you're looking at about 10x. On average, people use about 20% of their vocal range. And I'm particularly interested in the non-linguistic, the phenomena of voice. So if you think holistically on Earth, whether it's artificial or human-to-human uh, -human connection, the human voice is an absolute fundamental part of our relationships, of our loved ones, our working relationships. But also, like non-language is something that needs to be highlighted. If I spent my whole life speaking just like this, how would it affect my relationships, my loved ones? It would change the quality of my life. So range and experimentation and vocal phenomena is an absolute 
absolutely fundamental part of day to day. So for me, my theme of preservation, my theme of exploration, uh, more and more, the voice is becoming a very fascinating way to open people up to technology because of its absolute fundamental nature. So one method of preservation which is experimental is the art of the data set. So I've collected vast banks of uh, human voice data and primarily my own speaking data. So the voice you're about to hear um, might sound a little bit familiar. She sees. So I just want to decide that in this uh, meeting, um, they um, are most nice in I form. So this is just, and so this is uh, them, so, them so that uh, this, and this is not uh, with, and, and so now I'm next. Um, and so that very, very strange recording, um, is a, a very, very strange recording is a generative version of my voice using sample RNN. And I think one new narrative that's becoming more and more common in terms of preservation and legacy is the context, uh, the content, concept of the second self. So these vast amounts of data that we're producing, more and more opportunities are arising to be able to interact with that data. Obviously, artists are exploring the concept of the second self and AI second self uh, spawning. There is new language coming around this, but there's more and more of a responsibility for people to actually see this as a very fundamental part of their mirror image in life. So how is that being kept? Where is that being kept? And I think it's really interesting to think how we are preserving our legacy using technologies like this. A second element of my experimentation is switching modality. So voice is very much like smoke. It's this ephemeral thing that shifts and changes. And collecting thousands upon thousands of sounds around the world, I realized that there were opportunities to visualize the human voice. So I've been designing generative systems for around 10 years. Uh, we've generated hundreds of vocal sculptures, and I'm gonna show you an example here, and I'm gonna share a little bit of context. So this is a project called Sea Sound, um, where we open it up to the public, where hundreds of individuals could come in and visualize their voice. And the importance of that is when you change the modality of a piece of media, something very special can happen. The, the meaningfulness of experiential, because this is the, the key point I'm trying to make. Leaving media in its linear form is incredible. But to open up a new way to experience that meter or that technology can have some interesting effects. So a life-changing moment for me, we had 500 individuals meet us at the mill um, in New York. And in that line of people, there was a father with her, um, his daughter, who was like a koala bear on his leg, a very shy, small being. When she saw her opportunity to generate a piece like this, she made these tiny, tiny sounds and she saw it manifest two stories high, and she went from these tiny expressions to these vast, huge, screaming, laughing, and shouting um, expressions. So what's happening there? And I think the augmented relationship with technology, the ability to experience something in a new way, can open up the most shy, most biased individual. And I really believe that uh, we are living in an epidemic of bias, and any opportunity to open someone to a new idea, I think is a very, very important thing. So the most recent project uh, is Voice Gems, the 1,000 year archive. And I'm actually here to really ask you all a question, uh, which I'll get to the end. But this is the most recent generative system that I've designed, which is voice centered. Um, and effectively, it uses the voice to generate uh, high resolution um, digital gemstones. The project is utilizing a 200,000 particle system which responds to very specific features in voice. Whether the same recording is used twice, you arrive at the exact same work. 
So those fingerprint-like features uh, place the 200,000 particles, and features like resonance and articulation is actually uh, results in the specific coloring. So it's a very simple data visualization, but what's actually happening with this project um, was half expected and half unexpected. So I've been uh, reaching out to a set of remarkable individuals, and the manifesto of Voice Gems is to preserve the world's most unique, remarkable, but also vulnerable voices. So in this period of collection, um, two remarkable minds. Uh, on the left, we actually have uh, Herbert W. Franke, who's a pioneer of computational art, and on the right is Ai Weiwei. We asked them, what would you preserve? And on the left, uh, the late Herbert Franke preserved one of his poems, and Ai Weiwei actually submitted a simple conversation uh, between him and a friend, something that we see as very small, which is something I get to a little bit later. Here we have Sugwen Chung, an operator. Sugwen, who's an incredible AI artist, uh, had a dialogue with one of her second selves, her machine-based relationships. An operator uh, did something interesting. They actually sent in a poem which they both read at the same time. So we did two readings of both of their voices, generated two gems, and actually produced what we call a fusion voice gem. Outside of just literal contribution to voice, voice gems is an opportunity to holistically explore vocal phenomena. And this was the first set of uh, voice gems that we actually placed on chain called the internet gems. We collected 2,000 voices from anonymous individuals on the internet. They submitted these bizarre <laughs> interactions, some meaningful, some uh, playful, some strange. And we used that to generate a set of 20, 20 works, highlighting that anonymous uh, anonymity that happens online. So we're also interested in vocal phenomena. More importantly, institutions started to reach out to us. So an incredible individual called Ben Mirren, who's a, an explorer at National Geographic, sent us some of his field recordings and asked us the question, well, could we produce a set of objects that are generated from the voices of critically endangered species? So preservation isn't just a, a, a human need, but the ability to think laterally and generate these objects, and through the set of rules, start to develop this visual language. We now have 120 pieces, and we're aiming for thousands. Um, and having, having these, uh, that sheer amount of objects, each with a very unique story, is quite a challenge. Like, where does that live permanently? The sentiment is a thousand years, but what's the actual technical possibility with that? So immediately when we started to share uh, that challenge more, this idea of digital ceremony, and that's a very uh, un-tech uh, conference event kind of term, but what is the spiritual and ceremonial potential of decentralized preservation? Like what are the stories and the opportunities for emerging tech projects to tap into that deeply emotional utility that many traditions attempt to do. So something that we never expected is we started to receive hundreds and hundreds of requests of people that wanted to preserve what we see as small, sometimes uh, not precious media. But if you have recordings or moments on your phone, what we're finding, there's a huge demand for new tradition. So. This is a very unique piece. It's one of my favorites, and I just want you to listen to it first. Tell me your name. Casey. What's your name? Casey. Where did you go okay. today? Um, I went to the zoo. You went to the zoo? Yeah. You went in the wawa? Yeah. What, what animals did you see? Uh, penguins. Penguins? Yeah. Such a simple, small moment. Uh, children's voices always produce brighter gems. Um, and we isolated her voice and uh, removed the fathers just for uh, the rendering and the, the generative elements. But this piece 
is a dialogue between a father and a daughter. It's something that would exist as a voice note or uh, on cold mechanical devices. And when these moments pass on, whether it's a loved one that isn't here anymore or a moment like this where a child grows up, there is more and more a need to explore well, what are ceremonial ways of serving uh, this precious media? Are there ways of experimenting and testing the limits uh, of digital ceremony? And what is the role of these narratives being paired with the cutting edge of emerging technology? So the experiments continued. Uh, what you see here is actually uh, a physical 3D print of the underlying structure. Uh, this was generated by laughter. And we actually produced the world's first uh, lab-grown, uh, voice-generated crystalline form, which exists as a mirror uh, entity to the digital version. And the reason I'm here today is I'm really interested in what are the possibilities of full-spectrum preservation. I think more and more artists and projects are developing these huge collections of work but there will be more and more a need to bring true value from the cutting edge of visual, whether it's large-scale spectacle, sculpture, the memification of concept, uh, spoken word speaking is the first decentralized system, all the way through to deep chain opportunities. So I'm here to ask, how would you preserve a voice for a thousand years? There will be more and more artists like me that have these full spectrum portfolios and approach these technologies as uh, experiential knowledge and attempting to be explosive. But how can we uh, find the most incredible stories and pair it with the best examples um, of technology? Thank you.